Joel chapter 1 and 2. One of the little minor prophets over there. You go through Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, of course, which is just a small ending on the Jeremiah with Lamentations being five chapters. And then you get into Ezekiel. And then after that, you get into Daniel, Hosea, Amos, and then you break down into these really smaller books. I bet you liked that when you was reading one book per day, didn't you? And these minor prophets and say, oh yeah, four, three or four chapters, that's pretty good. But the book of Joel, not very long. Uh, again, three chapters. But chapter one and chapter two that I want to bring to you, is some of the descriptions that are used here of the circumstances that are explained. Now, the thing about the book of Joel is that even though the time frame about it is about 800 B.C., which again, David and Solomon were around 1,000 B.C., Israel was carried away into captivity around 712 B.C. So somewhere in between when Israel was carried away by the Assyrians, and then, of course, Jerusalem and Judah was carried away in 603 B.C., so this was a warning, a prophecy from the prophet Joel before the disaster came, before the destruction came. So chapter 1 and chapter 2, there are signs, there are descriptions of judgment, and then there is a command, a directive about what the church was supposed to do, what the, the children of Israel were supposed to do. Now the terminology that's used here. It's almost foreign to us today. Now, it's kind of funny because uh, if I get Jeremiah going, Jeremiah's grandson, he, he can start this language, and we can't tell what kind of language it is. Uh, I think it almost is like the unknown tongue, but I don't interpret. So I don't know what he's, what he's saying in this. But the, there are terms in this thing when you talk to the church today and it's like it's unheard of. You say, well, I've never heard that before. I've been in the church for 40 years. I've been in the church for 60 years. I never heard that before. Well, if it's in the book, what do you do with it? You've not been in the book? If it's in the Word, it's true because all the Word is truth. So in Joel chapter 1, chapter 2, I want to go through some of these sections of this. And again, I'm going to point out to you or bring to you where we're at in the need of this, because again, I see a parallel from these chapters about what we're experiencing right now and what the directive from God is that the children of God's children are supposed to be doing, but I don't see it. And so it bothers me, uh, especially after the week I've had, things I've seen, things I've heard, the things that are going on right now, I'm left with this question, where are we going? And I kind of like set it before the Lord with a hesitancy because I asked him, I said, what's coming next? Now again, the things where you've seen before where God kind of moves. And again, I, I, I know the history and I, I could stand here for the rest of the afternoon and tell the history that any time that revival came, God set his people to pray. So we had our 80 hours of prayer. Seven churches in Austin had their 168 hours of prayer. We've been doing the concert of prayer for over six months now. I know God's getting ready to do something. But where you see these people that keep saying, oh, well, revival's coming. God's going to send revival and all the wrongs are going to be made right and everything's going to be uh, set in a, in a way that pleases people. I don't know that that's necessarily the way it's going to be. Because I see the mushroom effect, you know, the nuclear bombs when they go off and it causes a mushroom cloud. I see a mushroom cloud brewing of all the things that we're experiencing right now. I mean, we are a nation of death right now with suicide rates, drug overdose deaths, homicides, uh, alcoholism, the cancers, the plagues, you know, Again, as we talked about natural disasters, record-setting snowfall and those kind of things, STDs, record-setting, children being born because of those diseases are now a crippling effect to them. Things that you don't, 
people aren't talking about, people aren't, aren't recognizing these things, but we're off the charts on these numerics. All these things are leading us to someone. Now again, to get to this place, and the phrase that's used here in chapter 1 and chapter 2, which is a consistent thing between Old Testament and New Testament, there is a day coming. It is called the day of the Lord. It is, not a, it is not the day of the Lord that people are saying, oh, well, that's, I'm going to get to go home. The day of the Lord is a day of judgment. It is a day of outpouring of God's wrath and anger upon the nations. And even though some people want to preach, oh, well, the church won't be here and we'll be raptured out and all those kind of things, we're in the midst almost of this now. So it's kind of like things that you and I have not seen for the last, any time in our lifetime, what we've experienced so far in 2019, it's off the charts. So I want to give you these things that's in the book of Joel 1 too, because there is no time frame in the book of Joel. There's no king that was ruling and reigning at this time that's mentioned. There's no, uh, again, reference to uh, Assyrians or Babylonians or Philistines or any of the enemies that we know was judgments upon the children of Israel in the Old Testament. It's just a generalization of the children of God and the children of these other nations that's mentioned in this. But again, to start with this, in chapter 1 of the book of Joel, we'll start reading down through this first chapter that we pull some of these things about what's going on. Verse 1, the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Bethuel. Hear this, you old men, give ear, all you inhabitants of the land, Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it. Let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. That which the palm of worm left has the locust eaten. That which the locust has left has the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm has left has the caterpillar eaten. Now, after all those worms and after all that eating, what's left? Nothing. Nothing. So again, we have a pestilence, don't we? We have something affecting the crops that is going to affect the bread source of all this. You kind of got to watch this stuff. You kind of watch the storms. You kind of watch the, the prices of food. Again, we've seen this on the meat market. Chicken, burger, cattle. We see it now with the deer and the, uh, what's the wasting disease uh, affecting Every week there's another E. coli bacteria, another, another week of recall, not just of a couple hundred pounds of food, but tens of thousands of food. And so again, this is constant, if not just once in a blue moon, once every six months, this is every week, every other week, there's something going on with this. God is able to take away the food source of any nation. Oh, well, we have an abundance of crops. Oh, well, we've got all this built up. Well, you can go ahead and brag if you want, but I know what God's capable of doing. And I know the book over in Genesis where it says is that there were seven years of plenty and then there were seven years of need, of need and want. So verse 4, God can send wave after wave after wave of these things that take away the food source. Verse 5, Awake, you drunkards. Weep, howl. Now again, the description of this, where we begin to see this weeping and the howling. Uh, but again, these are the alcoholics. These are those that are addicted to this and they, they have to have it. Now again, the worst way to hurt any alcoholic is to do what? Take it, Take it away from them. I mean, they're beside themselves. So they can't stand it. So they cry out in sorrow, in misery. They are cut off, for it is cut off from your mouth. A nation has come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he has the cheek teeth of a great lion. He has laid my vine waste. He has bark, uh, embarked my fig tree. He has made it to be clean bare, cast it away, and the branches thereof, they are made white. Lamb it like a virgin, girded with sackcloth, for the husband of her youth. The meat offering, the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. Now this is referenced several times. Again, the temple of the Lord was built and the priests were supposed to offer a meat offering and a drink offering daily, weekly, and monthly. 
But now because of the shortage of food and the shortage of drought of water, there is nothing to offer at the Lord's house. It's all been removed and taken away. There's something wrong. There's a judgment on the nation and on the land that takes away the food and the drink. And he said, well, I'll just run out here and get this water that comes out of the side of the mountain. Well, that's fine and sufficient, but again, isn't God able to undo all that? So again, where we have been so used to plenty, and I think about that as I watch California, when the electric company turns off the power, how long does your food keep? We saw this with Hurricane Katrina and other floods and disasters with this. When the power is knocked out and the temperatures soar, the freezers and the refrigerators really do no good, do they? So what's left? Now you say, well, I got canned goods and things like that. Well, that's good for you because, again, across 300 million people in the United States of America, how many people do you think still can anymore? We have become so addicted to Walmart, Food Line, and all the other food chains is that we think that it's always going to be that way. But a glimpse of California where the electric grid is shut off and it reveals to us is that we're not always going to have refrigeration and we're not always going to have plenty. Why? Because we forgot how much we owe God. You know, again, we're never thankful for a lot of things until we lose it. And then we realize what we have. But I don't hear a lot of people, and I don't see a lot of people at lunchtime or supper times or restaurants that they bow their head and say, Lord, thank you for that which I'm getting ready to eat. We are a very ungrateful nation, aren't we? And we assume that it's always going to be this way. But it was a generation ago, and some of you old timers, or what did he say there? You old men? <laughs> You old men, old ladies, if you take offense to that, then I'm talking about you. Yeah, but that's the scripture. That ain't me. But you old men and old ladies, do you remember the time where there was nothing in old Mother Hubbard's cupboards? Yes. There was just, how yeah, we're going to make it. There has been in our lifetime that. But this new generation, what do they know of that? Nothing. But I'm afraid, according to this warning, is that that which has been will be again. So he gives that comment there, lament, verse 8. Put on the virgin, gird it with sackcloth. Sackcloth, again, which is the humbling of oneself in the midst of this. Why? Because the temple of the Lord's offerings have been withheld. And he says at the end of that verse 9 there, let the Lord's ministers and priests do what? Mourn. Lamentation and mourning. I don't know when the last time you mourned uh, over something. But again, when we see the crisis that's upon our nation right now, it should be a breaking of the heart. There should be an anguish in the spirit of the church that causes us to mourn over what is. what this is. I, I don't like where we're at right now. I don't like what I see. I don't like what I hear. And again, when you try to speak truth to people, is that the first thing that they want to do is justify who they are and where they're at. Well, I believe in God. Well, I'm a Christian. Well, then why are you living in sin? Why are you living in rebellion? Oh, well, we live in a Christian nation. We are not a Christian nation. We have less than 10% of the population in church just today. 10%. That means, again, where people want to be optimistic and they want to say, oh, but 10% are in 30 million people are in church today. And that's what they want to focus on. I don't focus on that. I focus on where the other 90% are. How many people are in the NFL stadiums today? How many of the other people are sitting in front of a television set watching a movie? And how many of the people that got up today didn't even think about God or not even worshiping God? So they want to focus on 5-10%. I want to focus on the majority because God sees it all. God sees 100%. Where are we at? Lament and more. And then he goes into this verse 10. The field is wasted. The land mourns for the corn is wasted. The new wine is dried up. The oil languishes. So again, there is, there is a drought and a famine upon the land. In verse 11, be ashamed. O you husband, how, there's that expression again, how you vine dressers, 
for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field, it is perished. The vine is dried up, the fig tree languishes, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, the apple tree, even all the trees of the field, they are withered. Now that is some severe drought where all trees are withered, isn't it? Because joy is with, withered away from the sons of men. I hear, you hear, this has been constant. And now it's infiltrating into the church today. And I get, this really aggravates me, but it causes me to lament and mourn and howl just a little bit more. Mental illness. You ever heard so much about mental illness today? I'm telling you is that, again, they don't, joy is withered away. You know the opposite of joy? What is it? Sadness. 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 Sorrow, isn't it? You understand how people's minds, hearts, and lives are filled with depression, discouragement, sorrow. They, they don't know where to go, what to turn. Now, again, I can be surrounded by nothing but sorrow and sin and still be happy in Jesus, right? I know who my Redeemer is. I know where I'm going. Now, my circumstances may not be good. I might be sick. I might be uh, dying. I might be in poverty. I might have everything against me and everyone against me, but I still know who my Jesus is. That's my, that's my peace. That's my joy. And I'm not worried about me. I mean, I, I will face whatever the Lord decides for me to face in this lifetime, but I know whose I am and I know who he is for me. He's my master, my savior, my Lord. But I do, I am worried about what I see others going through. What I'm watching and listening that is happening in families today. What I hear in the headlines and read in the headlines. What I know is the condition of minds and hearts and souls and the joy is withered away from our nation. Most people are living for the here and the now. They are living to satisfy self for today. And their thoughts of eternity, they have none. They don't have the first clue of what's coming when they meet God face to face when they die. And most of the time, even at a funeral, it's not communicated properly. You know, everybody dies, goes to heaven, right? When we all get to heaven, they all want to sing that song. The most worst sinner in all this world. Well, they're, they're an angel in heaven today. Well, according to what? Not according to the scriptures. My Bible tells me is that how many is on the broad and the wide path that leads to hell? Many. Many. How many is on the straight and the narrow path that leads to everlasting life? But you would think by listening to out there in the world and talking to people is that it's reversed. Oh, just the most wicked of the earth are going down into hell, but all of us good people, I don't know no good people. Isn't that what Romans chapter 3 tells us? How many good are there? None. None. But if you talk to people, well, I'm a good person. I ain't so bad. They don't understand Scripture. And then you come into the church and you ask them and the mentality inside the church ain't much better. They have no clue about eternity. I sat with a woman in the intensive care unit up at the University of Pittsburgh and I asked of her that's been in the church for 60 years, Sunday school teacher, there every church service when the church doors were open and she's getting ready to die and I said, what's going to happen to you when you die? And she said, I have absolutely no idea. How do you sit in the church for 60 years and not know what's coming? One, the preacher ain't preaching the word and second, she was never in the book. That's the reality. And joy withers away. Mental illness that's a lie fabricated out of hell. It is the depression and the sorrow of the absence of God. Mental illness? How about demonic possession? How come you don't hear that terminology out there today? Demons are having their rule in the reign of people's lives today. But you don't hear that, and you can't say that in the church. Oh, well, that's just New Testament. That's just back in Jesus' day and time. They're still not here today, are they? There's no demons running around out there, are there? Let's all, let's all sit for a moment and think. Is there? Scratch our heads. Yes, there is. 
Satan is operating in full throttle just as he did during the times of Christ. But the joy is withered away. Grasp hold of these terms. Lamenting, mourning, howling. Joy is withered away. Languishing. Then verse 13. So now here comes, that's the circumstances. Famine, drought, conditions are bad. Now verse 13, here's the directive. Gird yourself, lamb at you priest, howl you ministers of the altar. Come, lie, lie when it's convenient to you, when you have time to do this in sackcloth. Is that what it says? All night. Lay all night. Remember, there used to be a time when the church had all night prayer meetings. I think we ought to become uh, old-fashioned. Maybe we we'll not use the electric. Maybe we ought to go all get oil lanterns. You all remember, how many of you got oil lanterns at your house just for decoration, right? Just in case the power goes off, right? I think we ought to set them on them pillars back there and have the oil lanterns. You know, then we can sing that song, Give Me Joy, joy Give Me Oil in My Lamp, right? You remember that song? Put oil in my lamp, keep me burning for the Lord. So we'll set them lanterns there and we'll have that to move. Have an all night prayer meeting and lament before the Lord. It's probably been. 40, 35, and 40 years since I was in an all-night prayer meeting. Now, again, we prayed 80 hours, but we was only doing half-hour and hour sections of that. But I'm talking about praying six, seven hours where we're laid out before the Lord because of the conditions that we see. Most churches don't understand this because they only have one hour of prayer a week, let alone an all-night. But if you knew... And again, my mindset of this, and I, I wrote this down last night and was trying to communicate this because, again, God spoke to me at work the other day, and I took my phone out and I tapped this, wrote this out, the reality of our situation today. And I had to type that out because I said, oh, that's the Lord. I don't want to forget that. And again, I've learned a lesson by now. If you don't write it down, what's going to happen in 10 minutes? It's going to be gone. So I was writing this stuff out, and I was trying to keep it so I had it. But in my prayer time, in my prayer closet, I was crying out, Lord, I can't get a grasp on this, and I can't get a fix on this. And I know part of that reason is, is because of there was, a, there was a statement that Rex Andrews, and again, I remind you who Rex Andrews was, in, in, um, in the 1949, somewhere around that time frame, 1945, right after World War II, this guy, Rex Andrews, was called to be a missionary. And so he learned Hebrew, and he was going to go to Israel and he was going to evangelize the Jews, bring the Jews to Christ. Okay, Lord's calling is on him, go do it. So he got his support. He moved to Israel and no sooner had he, he hadn't been six months in Israel and God speaks to him and says, I want you to go back to the United States. I want you to be an intercessor in the United States. And he says, but Lord, I just got here. I got all these people supporting me and I'll, I'll have to, uh, almost like an embarrassment to tell them is that it wasn't that I changed my mind, but God was giving me a new directive. And he, God says, I said, now you imagine contradicting God, questioning God, but he, he yielded, he, he obeyed. And so he said, I'll go back. And so for 30 years, Rex Andrews, right north of Chicago, in a place called Zion, Illinois. Boy, did I, boy do I wish I would have known about this guy earlier in my life before he died, passed away, because I would have loved to have met him. But for 30 years, he prayed from 10 p.m. till 5 a.m. every night. No vacations, no sick days, no hit and miss. Every night for 30 years. Now, I don't know, uh, mathematician, 365 times 30. Is that a million days? No, about 11,000. 11,000 days? Okay, straight. And he would pray, and he had this statement that he told Leonard Ravenhill. He said, I, I would always pray till the burden was lifted. That caught me. I pray, but sometimes I walk out of my prayer times, like we did last night. I walk out and I get back in the car, and I still got a burden on me. I still got a pressing in my spirit. And something's still not right. Like I haven't prevailed. I haven't wrestled. I haven't followed through with this thing. And I realize that's on me for not praying rightly with this. And so I realize that that's the goal. Pray till the burden is lifted. And so the burden upon our nation, upon the church, upon families, 
I pray with that urgency and fervency of the hour because what's at stake? This might be my last day. And when I come to the close of this, if I stand before God, can I say, will God say of me, you did well? Or did, did I fail? Did I just go through the motions of church services? Did I just sing the songs because that's what we do? I read the Bible, but did I read with intent and purpose? Or did I do it so that the burden can lift? And God says, I've heard you, and I'll answer you. See, it's not just enough for God to say. It's not enough for me to, to say, for God to say to me in my prayer time, I heard you. You know, I, I say that to Georgie all the time. Yeah, I heard you, but that doesn't mean I'm going to do it. She's got the list, you know. Yeah, I heard what you want. I heard what you need, but I may not follow through with that. But am I content for God to do that to me? Yeah, I heard you, because I hear all things. I'm, I'm omnipotent, I'm omnipresent, I'm omniscient, and I know all things, so I know what you prayed for, but you didn't really mean it. You didn't pray with faith. You didn't pray to prevail. You didn't pray for the burden to be lifted, and so it still remains. Well, that, that's, that's futile. That's a waste. And I think most of the church praying is like that today. Well, we prayed for the sick, we prayed for the lost, we prayed for the circumstances, but we didn't prevail on nothing. So nothing has changed. Hell is very content for the church to pray in such a manner like that. But a weeping and a mourning and a lamenting and staying all night until the burden is lifted, that's what he's talking about. Don't you understand? The food's gone. The land is languishing. The crops are gone. The people are perishing. Aren't you burdened? Aren't you concerned? The drug crisis, the suicides, the murder suicides. We see all these things. We know all these things. But you realize how many churches are lamenting and mourning over this thing? It's a hard thing to find. It's a, it's a shadowy thing in our day and midst with this. Now he goes on with other conditions in the midst of this, but down in verse 19, he, he continues with this. O oh Lord, to you will I cry, for the fire, it has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. Can you see California? And the flame, it has burned all the trees of the field. Now dropping down into chapter 2, he continues with this. Below the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord, there's our introduction to this. The day of the Lord comes, for it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness, a day of gloominess, a day of clouds, a day of thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong. There has not been ever the like to this. Don't we say the same thing in 2019? Have we ever seen our nation like this? Have we ever seen storms like this? Historic record-setting storms. We've never seen this. Have we ever seen 33,000 suicides in a year? Never. Have we ever had 70,000 drug overdose deaths? Never. We have never seen where every family is affected by drugs and alcohol and cancer. Never. We have never seen the churches in such a low state of attendance and prayer meetings at an all-time low. We have never been this way before. It cause, it's supposed to cause an alarm. It's supposed to cause an, a stirring, saying, wait a minute, we're, we're in trouble. We, we are in desperate need and desperate trouble. Verse 3, a fire devours before them and behind them, before and behind. And behind them there's a flame burning the land as a garden of Eden before them. And behind them nothing but desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses and a horseman. So shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of the mountains shall they lean. Like the noise of a flame of fire that devours the stubble. And as a strong people set in battle array. And again, before their face, the people should be much pained. And all the faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. And they shall march every one 
on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks, neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path. And when they fall again to the sword, upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. And there's more to go into that, but that's not the purpose of the sermon today. But the earth, it shall quake before them, and the heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark. The stars shall withdraw their shining, and the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. For his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. And again, for the day of the Lord, it is great. It is very terrible. Who can, who can abide in it? And then here comes the directive. After that certain sequence of events from verse 1 to verse 11, and all that is wrong, and all the great things of the day of the Lord that has come upon them, now God gives another directive to his people. Therefore, also now, saith the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, great kindness, and he repents himself of the evil. For who knows, and you hear me praying this all the time in these days, who knows if he will turn, return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord our God. Well, in chapter 1, we read that the meat and the drink offering was cut off from the house of God, didn't we? Now here we see where God may provide a meat offering and a drink offering for his own self. And then in verse 15, blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people together, and guess what they're supposed to do? Weep and howl and mourn again. Circumstances of chapter 1 and chapter 2 without reading all of this again, because again it goes down through very descriptive behaviors of what's coming on the land, what's coming upon the people. And God speaks to his people and he says, and this is what I need you to do. Now again, lift up your eyes and see what's happening to our nation. What's happening to the homes of people that you know, neighbors, family members. What's going on inside the homes? If you know the old saying, if you was a fly on the wall, what would you hear and what would you see in most homes that are in Hampshire County, West Virginia, and across the United States. When I, when I hear about, you know, Georgia comes from school, Hannah comes from school, and we hear, I hear about these, these kindergartners, I hear about these pre-K, I hear about these elementary schools, Philip comes home, Rebecca comes home, who's in the high school, they come home. We have the boys that sit at the table, and I hear about, from them, and I know what's going on in their homes. And I hear about uh, Snapchat and, and Instagram and Facebook and the social media. And I see these kids, what they're posting, and their hearts are broken. And they're left to themselves and the neglect and the abuse and all the things going on. And I lift up a cry because I know inside the homes that they are broken and that they are in devastation. Do you know anybody like that? We all do. And upon the streets... And upon the lives of so many people, what's going on inside the minds and the hearts of people that you and I are, are talking to and talking with. They've given up hope. Their joy is withered. They won't come to church. They're obstinate against the gospel. You say, man, if you just come to church and just get right with the Lord, things would be so much better for you because, again, God is able to help. God is able to save. God is able to heal. God is able to do this. And they torch some little reply. Well, I used to try that. Or, yeah, I used to believe in that. But now I'm telling you, I'm just so far in my life right now. I don't have time to go to church. I don't want to go to church. Some of them are just that brazen and bold anymore. But don't you understand is that the day of the Lord is coming in the near future? And that all the signs and the handwritings on the wall of where we're at and what's going on is right now with us. And every circumstance and situation that we see across the board, from people's education to the medical, right down to the political, to the religious. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you like to be a political figure getting ready for the presidential election next year? Huh? Are you watching this circus going on out there? Boy, I'm telling you, sign me up. 
I tell you, I want to be abused and, and, and run underneath the bus uh, like they're doing to each other out there. Yes, sir, but I remember a day when it was a little dignified. Mm -hmm. I remember a day when it was about morals and values. I remember a day that it wasn't like this. As your leaders are, so your people will be. I see the dilemma on the, on the football field. Now that guy that didn't want to, took a knee in the pledge of, or during the national anthem and all the sorrow that went with that. I see the high schoolers doing it today. I see the college players doing it today. I see everything about money and greed and possessions and how much they can get. I lift up my eyes and I look upon the horizon and I read Joel chapter one and chapter two and I see that there is a need upon us like never before and the joy is withered. And I hear the directive of God because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he says, weep and lament and mourn and howl because of what will be if these things are not corrected. I think we have a limited time right now. I think with the prayer movement that we just came through is that God was getting ready to do something and I'm not so sure that the burden was lifted after 80 hours of prayer. I'm not so sure it was lifted after the churches down there prayed 168 hours. I think maybe we should have done it for 30 days. And prayed until the burden was lifted because I think God, I know God wants to work. I know God wants to move, but I know his church ain't ready. And I want to be ready. And I think upon the landscape of our horizon is that the day of the Lord's getting ready to come. And it's what so many people want to say, oh, revival's coming, great awakening's coming. And they interchange the two like, they, like, like it's one and the same and it's not is that I'm not saying that it's not going to happen, but I see more is that God is ready to do this, judgment. Now I'm praying that in the midst of that is that revival would come, will come. And somewhere God works all things is that I trust. And I go back to Genesis chapter 18, verse 14. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Yes, he will. God don't make mistakes. But I can't say the same for the church. And I can't say the same for Dan Beiser. Pray till the burden is lifted. And that is a whole host of events and names and faces and situations. Pray till the burden is lifted. Because this is what's at stake. Howling? I've only heard tales of it. I remember a guy talking about when the Koreans, the South Koreans, would have their prayer meetings and they would have a prayer time and they would pray and you could hear them praying together or praying out loud and it was all dignified and in order and, and those kind of things. But then they would come to the last section of the prayer and that would be for lost family members. And they, all, they would all take pictures out of their wallets and out of their pockets and they would lay them out across the uh, place that they was at in front of them. And then that place would turn into a place of howling and weeping. Screaming. I was down at, at Heart Cry for Revival, and I think it was 2006, 2008, and Jim Cimbala was down there, and 500 pastors were in that auditorium that day. And he was winding up his sermon, and he told the story of his daughter, his oldest daughter, Hannah, and how she ran out into the world and got into the things of the world and, and he would lament before God and mourn before God for months. And that, that night that that prayer meeting at, at Brooklyn Tabernacle turned into a, what he called a labor delivery room and where there was screaming and shouting and defiant against the devil. Give, give that man back his daughter. And they prevailed that night because within 48 hours, his daughter was back home repentant. The prodigal had returned. Glory, right? And Jim Cimbala turned that on us. And he said, is there any of you sitting here, 500 pastors and wives, is there any of you here today that has a son, a daughter, a grandson, a granddaughter that's out in the ways of the world? I'm, there's there's three sections in that auditorium, and I'm sitting clear over there to, against the wall. So I, I have a whole perspective 
of the entire theater. And he said, if there is one of you sitting, one of you sitting here today that has a son or daughter, grandson or granddaughter, that, that's a prodigal and out. Like you raised them on Proverbs, bring a child up in the way that you would have them to go. When they're old, they'll not depart from it. They was in church every time the church doors were open. I, I want you to come down on this altar so I can pray for you. Now, in a Baptist church, dignified, we, 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 we walk respectfully and we come quietly and reserved. I'm telling you, I've watched people run down the aisle. They couldn't get to the altar fast enough. I've seen it fill up one row, two rows, three rows. Clear back up the sinners. I heard people screaming. I heard people sobbing. My heart broke because there was lamenting, howling, and mourning for their sons and their daughters and the waywardness of their sin. And I knew then in 2006 that this is what is to come. This is what our nation is at. That was 13 years ago. We've not gotten better. We've gotten worse. Every home affected. Look around us. Every one of us desires for our sons and our daughters and our brothers and our sisters and our grandchildren to be sitting right beside us in this place of worship, don't we? And they're not here. Is there not a cause to lament and mourn and how? I sat in the midnight hour last night and I penned, if this was my last day, what would my last prayers be for them? And then God turned it on me and he says, but what if this is their last day? What will you do? And I wept. Oh God, don't let them. Is there not a cause? Yeah. Drugs, suicides, and evil minds and hearts affected, the neglect and the abuse in the homes and the schools every week. And the church goes on as if nothing is happening. I can't read Joel 1 and 2 and not be broken because that's where we're living right now. God gives the direction. When you see these things happening, call for a solemn fast, call a solemn assembly, have the people come together, lie all night in sackcloth, mourn, weep, howl, lament. Where do you see these things at? Are they in your secret closet? Is your carpet, floor, stained with tears and snot? Have you grabbed with the nails of your hands, clawing, saying, God, I will not be denied. I mean, intense. I get some right, some people's minds, I get indignant with God because I'm demanding of that. Don't let this be. And I do shout, and I do raise my voice, and I do clench my fist because I know what's at stake. And I know that I can't fix it. And you can't fix it. But there is a God who sits in the heavens who is God of all. And he can. Yes. And I cry out to God, do what only you can do. Because I know what's at stake. Our future of our nation is at stake. We will not make it another 30 years in this current plight. We will not last any longer than that. Judgments are happening so fast People are dying left and right. And it is, it, this is upon us. The day of the Lord is upon the United States of America. And he calls his church to respond. And they thumb their nose at him and said, no, we're going to have another movie night. No, we're going to have another entertainment night. We're going to have this. We're going to have that. But they won't do what God said do. It's on us. We will answer for it. I made you watch me. Watch me. It means you get on the tower, and if you do not sound the warning to your loved ones, their blood is on your hands. Brother, sister, I got blood on my hands. 
we got an answer for this because of our responsibility and neglect of it. Pray till the burden is lifted. And I keep begging God and asking God, don't let me go on without that resolve. Give me the desire of my heart, Lord, that you put within me. I don't mean to be, I am not to be Rex Andrews. Everybody's different. But I do know that that phrase is right. And so it is, is that again, when you and I see our families and we see Hampshire County and we see West Virginia and the conditions and the courses of our nation, it is time to cry out to God. God, help us in this most desperate hour. I cannot tell you how many times I've prayed it this week.